Hello and welcome to Griffith Christian Students Week 9 Main Meeting. I'm James Hewitt and I study a Bachelor of Film and Screen Media at the Griffith Film School. And you might be here, you might have accidentally clicked on the link, so you might be wondering what is Griffith Christian Students? Well, we're a group of students from Griffith who open God's Word and investigate it through the Bible. And tonight we're going to be opening up one of the passages in Philippians. So, what are we looking at in Philippians? We're going to be looking at how Jesus impacts all aspects of our lives. But I have a question for you guys. What areas of your lives has Jesus not impacted? It might be something good to think about while Peter gives us a talk soon. So, what else is there? We have the Connect Cards. If you haven't filled one out, if you're new at Griffith Christian Students or you want to get in contact with us, we'll have a link to Connect Cards, I believe, in the chats of both Zoom and the Facebook live stream. And so if you have new details, you're new here, or you just feel like you need something to keep you awake, we'd love you to fill that out. And for during the live stream, we'll be, we'd love for you guys to leave your comments, questions, anything you're not sure of in the chats, either on Facebook or on Zoom. If you're not on the Zoom and you would like to be, you can send a, you can ask to join and we'll get you those details. So you'll be able to join us and see all the black squares while we listen, but it'd be good to have you. So tonight we're lucky enough to have guests with us. And those guests are Nathan Gatenby and Kate Worley. They are both ex Griffith Christian students and Griffith Con graduates. And now I've been told that they're studying at ANAM, which I assume is a good music school. It's the Australian National Academy of Music. I know nothing about music, so I'm sure it's great. The last and probably most exciting news is information about NTE. If you don't know what NTE is, it's the national training event where all AFES students from across Australia are invited to come and join for a week of studying. But with COVID, we can't go to Canberra where it's usually held. So what we're doing, what has been announced is QT, Queensland training event, which there will be two nights of live streaming from NTE. <laughs> and there'll, but there will also be the most exciting part, a five day trip, a five day camp in Mount Tambourine. But on between in December, between the dates of the 7th and the 11th. So really excited for that. If you need more info, there's a Facebook event or you can get in contact with any Griffith Christian student and we can probably get you to that. So excited for that. And on to the theology hotspot. Thank you, James. Uh, tonight we're going to be thinking together about how Jesus uh, should impact all of our life. I'm going to move that so you can actually see me. There we are. We've carefully aligned lights and plants in the background and now I've moved it. Uh, thanks for being here tonight. Uh, I'm Peter, this is Catherine. Hi. And we're going to be thinking about how Jesus impacts all of our life tonight and how there's, there should be no part that remains uh, unimpacted when you live for King Jesus. Uh, so what, is, what does it look like to live for King Jesus? Well, we're thinking about incarnation again tonight. Uh, if you don't know what incarnation means, it's the idea that we find in the Bible. Theologians use the word incarnation to talk about the idea that Jesus is both God and man. And I can see straight away, please no more kebab references. I won't be talking about kebabs. Uh, fully God, fully man, fully sick. Uh, what I will talk about is we. You know, the, the original illustration was chili con carne, which is chili with meat. And so... Jesus is God con carne. He is God with meat. God become human. So how does Jesus literally put flesh on the bones of living for Jesus in all parts of life? That's what we're thinking about now. Uh, incarnation is really great news because uh, we don't have to figure out ourselves what it looks like to live for King Jesus but we can actually look to his example. We can look to his life and he, he shows us, he models it for us. He actually literally incarnates for us how we can live for his kingdom. So it's worth asking, what do we learn when we watch Jesus? Is he a good model for putting this stuff into practice? And uh, 
There are a bunch of ways that we're going to be see that Paul talks about living for the kingdom in tonight's passage. We're going to be starting there soon, Philippians 4. Uh, but I just want to start by talking about two of those ideas before we get there. Two ideas uh, that are ways that Jesus lives for the kingdom and incarnates for us what it looks like to live for the kingdom. They are number one, rejoicing, and number two, praying. So rejoicing and praying. So the questions then are, what do we see of Jesus rejoicing and what do we see of Jesus praying that we can actually learn from and that we can put into practice ourselves? So let's take a crack at the first one, rejoicing. Oh, I've got a cat rubbing against me all of a sudden. That freaks me out a bit. It's uh, not that's a not, Zoom meeting without a pet. It's not a strange feeling at all. Um, Catherine, what, what stories do you think of? When you think about Jesus rejoicing. I'm trying not to think about a cat just bombing into the meeting. Yeah. Um, let me pick her up. Um, yeah. Speaking of, this is the devil incarnate. <laughs> I don't know how to draw this back. Um, I was going to share something about how wonderful it is to have, um, to know God because he actually came and became one of us so he can actually know what it's like. He's actually mm. just displayed yeah. for us what it's like to be like him and live on this earth which is so messed up and so I think like when I was looking at the stories of Jesus I think often like the extraordinary stories about Jesus kind of grab your attention like when he performs a miracle or um yeah like walks on water heals someone casts out a demon all this stuff is kind of just so beyond what we experience in everyday life that just kind of grabs our attention but I think we often just miss the everyday humanity of Jesus. And, um, yeah, we just forget things like he had friends and family. He um, he hung out with them regularly. They, they're often just pictured in the Bible as just eating and drinking and enjoying life, just everyday things. You mm. see them when they're mm. sick, when they're happy, when they're just working. Like he had mm. a very everyday kind of existence. And I think if we pay attention to his humanity, we actually um, – see lots of examples of Jesus rejoicing and that gives a picture to yeah. us of how we should also rejoice well in life, rejoice mm. about the good things. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I guess some examples of Jesus rejoicing, like Jesus went to weddings and he didn't just go mm. to a wedding. He actually turned water into wine and made it even even better wedding. Yeah. Like that's, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, festivals were a big part of mm. Jesus' culture. So, yeah. Everyone loves a good festival, right? So Jesus went to, I think, I think COVID John, safe. COVID safe, of course, social distancing, all that hoo ha. Um, in John's Gospel, Jesus went to at least, I think, seven Jewish festivals. Yeah, uh, and it's a lot. It's yeah. a lot of, yeah, sometimes it's somber, but a lot of, there's a lot of rejoicing going on in there. Um, trying to think what else. Oh, yeah, I was also thinking that the night before Jesus died, which he was probably pretty scared about what was going to come his way, he actually celebrated a um a meal and enjoyed Passover Passover yeah. with his friends um yeah another thing that we thought about was that um Jesus hangs, hangs out with children a lot and seems to enjoy yeah. them as well I don't know if you know anything about kids I've got a couple um it's all about silliness and crazies they just get the crazies so much I can imagine that Jesus would have just enjoyed giggling and just just the crazies that kids can do yeah like he was a kid too that's a mm. thing like he, mm. Yeah. Anyway, that's just a few thoughts. Yeah. So Jesus went through a lot of ordinary stuff, a lot yeah. of kind of normal everyday stuff. Uh, he worked. He worked hard. He had long days. He had long nights. Uh, he went through tough times too. He grieved the death of loved ones. He faced lots of opposition. Uh, the the gospels are full of plenty of verbal abuse that he received, uh, and his whole life had this intensity about it. And so you, you could kind of forgive him for just being a a serious guy, uh, but he's not just a serious guy, is he? Like he he uh, he stops to join the party. Uh, he rejoices. He, he participates in festivals. He has these amazing interactions with people that show a genuine warmth and and love and, and joy. So Jesus, uh, yeah, for this first idea, he's, he's a good model for rejoicing at all times. He incarnates for us what it looks like to rejoice. So turning a corner of enters to that uh, second idea, uh, what about when it comes to praying instead of worrying? Uh, in tonight's passage, we're going to be seeing that uh, we're told not to worry but to pray. Catherine, what do you think about when you think of Jesus praying? Well, I think 
for starters, just taking a step back, being told to just don't worry, just pray. Like that's just such a trite thing. That's how do you even do that? Like that's just a really mm. difficult thing. But I think again, looking to Jesus is kind of helpful. And even if we don't, we can't do it like perfectly like he did. But the fact that he he does it is just an encouragement to us. Like he actually, yeah, he's. It reminds us again, the fact that Jesus prayed reminds us again that he was actually fully human. Mm. Um, mm. You'd think that if he's God, why wouldn't he, why does he need to pray? Surely he'd just have some sort of like yeah. telepathic connection to God and yeah. just innately know that he'd talk to the spirit of the father without, um, but no, he prays just like we would and just like mm. we can pray. Um, so I guess time and time again, you see in his ministry that he's actually, he withdraws to pray. Like he takes some time out from his day to actually talk to God and actually express what's on his heart and what's on his mind and just what he's going through. Um, he, yeah. You could think that he'd just, you know, I'm um, just going to have a nap or go to the local or whatever, you know, just go have a coffee, whatever they did back then to chill out. But, you know, he doesn't, he prays um yeah he does this often he does it in ordinary ways I guess but then coming back to I guess the night before he died that was actually a really anxious time for him like he's actually about to get murdered um he's clearly worried and anxious but what he actually does in that situation is he prays um so he actually we, we can actually look to Jesus and see that in his worry and anxiety he actually turns to God and prays mm. doesn't take away the horrible reality of what's to come for him but he can just He's just modelling what it's like to have that open, yeah, open channel to talk to God. Mm, which is really helpful, isn't it? Because it shows us, you know, like that being worried isn't wrong. Being anxious isn't wrong because Jesus was worried about facing the cross. So he was anxious about it. But the thing we should do when we're worried, the right thing is, is to pray and talk to God to, to bring it to the Lord in prayer. So there you have it. There's your theology hotspot tonight, uh, Incarnation Part 2. We, we've seen Jesus, fully God, uh, fully man. He shows us how to put this passage that we'll be seeing uh, in Philippians uh, into practice. He incarnates rejoicing for us uh, at all times, and he incarnates praying instead of worrying. That's us. Cool. I think we're going to hand over to Josie now, who is going to pray and read the Bible for us. So, yeah, Josie, are you there? Hi. All right. I'm a um, Bachelor of Music Honours student, just for context. Uh, my name's Josie. I'm very nearly finished. I'm uh, very, very looking forward to reading this passage. This is one of my favourite passages. So let's pray before we read. Father God, thank you that we can discover what you're saying to us, that you reveal yourself to us in the Bible and reveal yourself to us in Jesus, who shows us what it means to rejoice and what it means to pray. And um, I just pray that you'd help us to understand what to do from hearing this word today. And I pray that you would help us to live it out in our daily lives. Amen. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown, in this manner stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me and the God of peace will be with you. Thanks, Josie. Um, well... 
Hi everyone, this is Catherine. Um, I've um, come back. I'm actually now going to talk to a couple of people who aren't just in the next room like Peter. They're actually in two other states that aren't Queensland and they couldn't be in the same room with me even if they wanted to. So I'm just going to ask um, Kate and Nathan to um, unmute yourselves and turn on your videos. And are you guys there? Hey -o. Hello. How are you guys going? Well, where did Nathan go? I'm back. Good. You're back. That's great. So you, um, you guys are old friends of ours. Um, you've been around in the past. Um, you're con graduates and current students at AM. Um, yeah, we just there's a lot of people who may not have known you here, but can you just ba do a basic introduction of yourselves? Um, just tell us a bit about yourself and maybe something fun where you live, that sort of thing. Um, Kate, did you want to go first? You're unmuted. Sure. Oh. Nathan, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, I'm Kate. Thanks for having me tonight. Um, I am currently in Adelaide. I'm with my family, but yeah, I did move up to Brisbane to study back in oh, 2015 or something really long ago. Um, and yeah, I then moved to Melbourne um, to study at Annam. That was like the start of last year. Um, but yeah, since COVID, um, have just come back and I'm doing um, online study here. So. Yeah, about you, oh. Nathan. What's something fun that people may not know about you? Oh, I mean, um, I do love a good cup of tea. That's probably, yeah. I don't know if that's fun. It's fun for me. So. Oh, it's definitely good. Um, what's what, what have you been drinking this evening? Because you had a cup of before. Oh, I do, yeah. Um, this one is actually my favourite tea shop is in Brisbane. It's the Tea Centre. Would highly recommend if anyone's into tea or if you're not, good place to start. So, yeah. Yeah, excellent. Cool. Nathan, how about yourself? Yeah, uh, I am from Brizzy and studied at the Con from 2015 through to 2018. Uh, and then I worked in Brisbane for a year and then moved down here to Melbourne this year. So I'm a first year studying percussion at NM. Uh, and yeah, I'm in Melbourne, so I can go 5Ks from my house at the moment. <laughs> Lucky you. Um, yeah, what's something random fun? I hear you into vegetable instruments. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is what you get for doing a percussion degree. Uh, is uh, Last year, a bit of some of my work was to make school shows uh, using instruments out of vegetables, so like a carrot recorder and eggplant castanets. Uh, but today I was practising uh, with some cups, so you never know what's in the life of a become. <laughs> I'm glad you spent four years at uni doing that. Um, yeah, great. So thanks for joining us. Now, um, there's a lot of yeah, some art students here who probably don't know anything about Anim and some con students who may be thinking about Anim in the future. Do you reckon you could describe what Anim actually is? What's a typical day like? Um, that sort of thing. Um, either of you feel free to kind of chip in on that one. I can go if you want, Nathan. <laughs> um, yeah, you've been there a year longer and and yeah, not under COVID, not Kate. Weeks of, of Anam in real life. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's kind of like it's not a university as such. You don't graduate with a degree or anything. Um, but I think most people do what's called the professional performance program. So just really like fancy term for you just get to play a lot which is awesome and why a lot of people choose to go um so you have like lessons and rehearsals and concerts almost every week um none of which is possible at the moment but that's like kind of a normal year at Annam, I'd say yeah so what's it been like for you this year Nathan. yeah this year uh we've obviously been doing everything online so I get uh, about two lessons a week over Zoom. Uh, and then we've had a bunch of international guests in like Q&A sessions. So we've had like conductors like Simone Young, composers like Elena katz uh Some percussionists have been uh, like the principal percussionists of like the New York Phil, Sydney Symphony, Chicago Phil, um, a tabla player. Yeah, so we've actually been able to get lots of uh, sort of more varied inputs than we otherwise would have if we were all in person this year. Mm, yeah, it's been a bit of a, yeah, a flip side to the not being around. Mm. It's been kind of cool like that. So, yeah. Um, so you guys were both, you're saying you're both probably first years around 2015 at the con. Do you guys have like a standout memory from your time four years at the con? 
Uh, there was one time that I got stuck in the staircase near the opera space. Uh, I went in on a Sunday and I went went that back way to go down to the percussion room and then I tried to open the door and it was locked. And so I had to call security, but the number, like I, I had the, my ID card, which had security on the back, but uh, it called the Nathan campus. And so I had to explain to them where, oh, it was just a nightmare. They got me out eventually, but yeah, uh, <laughs> that's that's uh, a good fun memory from the con. Yeah, true. How about you, Kate? Oh, I don't think I had anything quite that dramatic happen. <laughs> Um, Wasn't there something about a violin in the city cat? Oh, I, yeah. Or don't mention that in public. No, no, it's okay. We're all friends here, you know. I think I like, yeah, it was right before a Bible study and I left my bag on a ferry and yeah, that was dramatic. But someone lovely like found me on Facebook and messaged me. And anyway, all worked out well, but stressful times there for a while. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, I just cut you off there. Um, yeah, so what was it like for you guys to be um, students at the con, but also Christians while you were studying? Go for it, Nathan. Uh, there we go. Uh, I feel like uh, we had a few Christians in our cohort, um, quite a lot of string players from memory. Um, so it was really good being able to see each other in the hallways, do classes with one another. Um, you know, Kate and I, we even did some oral uh, group stuff together um, yeah but then we did have uh, Bible studies at the time when we started uh, I think yeah, just Peter was on campus one day a week uh, so we didn't have any Bible talks and it was almost just like the, the start of building this sort of group and, and culture and community of Christians at the con uh, yeah which I really enjoyed uh, and so over time it was great to see more new faces come and join us and become more involved in the group uh, and then at one point, Kate and I were leading a Bible study together, which was really good to, um, yeah, dig into the word ourselves and um, also be able to lead other people to do that at the same time. Yeah, cool. Thanks for that. Well, how about you, Kate? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was like reflecting back on it a bit today and it's like amazing how much it grew like while we were there. And then it just seems like it's blossomed even since, you know, we've left and everything. So it's great to see. Um yeah, also there were like, um, we were encouraged to do like one-to-one -one meet up. So I, I think if you guys know Ellie from a few years back, um, got to know her really well. She's so beautiful and yeah, that was a blessing. And then got to hang out with Catherine a bit as well. Um, and I think, yeah, also like towards the end of our time, um, there was like a prayer trio thing happening. And um, yes, yeah, so we got to do that. and. Um, yeah, it's kind of lots of different areas to get involved with, which was really great. Yeah, I think from memory, 2015 was Peter's first year actually doing one day a week on campus. That was pretty much brand new with you guys. So you're kind of like the first generation of the group at the moment. So it's, it's encouraging to see and hear your reflections back on that. Um, yeah, so tonight, I think, um, yeah, actually also Ellie, we had her as a special guest probably about four, four or five weeks ago. So yeah, so you've been getting all the old crew back. So that's kind of cool that you remember her fondly as well. Um, tonight, we're thinking about how to bring all of our life, I guess, under the reign of King Jesus. So um, maybe I was wondering if you guys have any reflections, like what sort of things or circumstances have made it hard for you to kind of live with Jesus as your King since you've kind of finished up in uni and moved out into the, the big world and gone to Anam and all that sort of stuff? Like what's made it hard to follow Jesus? What challenges have there been? I guess because uh, I had spent a year working uh, when, once I was out of the con and so it's very easy just to get into sort of the like daily grind. For me that was a bit of teaching and, and performing as well um, and I guess at the con there's like this group here is, is a great space to um, continue asking big questions about faith and things but it's easy to sort of um, let that slip a little bit. Uh, so, yeah, whilst we've been at NM this year, we have um, been able to have a Bible study together with a few NM students. There's maybe about five or so Christians uh, at NM, um, which has been really great to encourage one another. Uh, we've been reading through some parables uh, or prayers throughout the Bible uh, and, and a few different sections as well. So, um, yeah, always keeping Jesus at the forefront, I think, has been important. Um, and something that uh, Kate and I and a few others have been able to encourage one another through NM as well. Yeah, it sounds like it's something you have to actually work at. It doesn't just 
automatically happen. Yeah, you know, we don't have any staff workers at NAM to help us out. So it's sort of up to us to do this. And it's, if we don't want to do it, it's not going to happen. If, if we want to do it, but we're too lazy, it's not going to happen either. Um, yeah, it takes intentional effort to encourage one another. Um, so yeah, it has been really good, particularly this year with COVID and all that, to have that space of uh, knowing there's still Christians around and encouraging each other in our faith. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Kate, have you got any thoughts on, yeah, what's been hard for you? Oh, it's actually quite funny because, um, yeah, I did Anam last year as well. And yeah, just so weird going from such a like kind of, yeah, having a structured Christian group at the place you're studying to there being like, you know, nothing and also just a lot less Christians in general. So I think in my year there were maybe like one or two or there are one or two others. And whereas at the con we had, I don't know, I reckon there was at least, what, 15 or 20, I don't know. Anyway, mm-hmm. there was a lot. Um, yeah, so that was a really big adjustment for me, I think, um, like going from, yeah, feeling really supported to then like having to, yeah, I guess fend for myself a little bit more, but still having some beautiful Christian friends there as well. Um and yes, we attempted to get something started last year, but the schedule is just such a crazy thing, kind of like at the con, um, but I'd say maybe even more. And so it's just really hard to find like a regular time to meet. Um, so not very proud to say it, but I think we may have met up like a total of four times last year. Um, so it's still, still great to know like there were others um, there like with you and have those friendships and things but this year has been so so encouraging just to see how that has developed and like um that's kind of because of COVID really like now we're online and able to um commit to yeah spending weekly time together so like that's been amazing how God's um worked through yeah this weird year (laughs) and we've even had uh two different non-Christians come and join us as well uh, which especially when online, uh, you know, someone can't, e- can't even just stumble into a conversation and join us. Uh, you, that invitation has to happen. Um, so, yeah, it's been really great to see those people come along uh, and ask questions about Jesus and about the, the passages we're reading. Um, and, yeah, hopefully develop uh, some faith in them as time goes on too. Yeah, well, we're praying that that kind of translates into real life once, you, once everything's back. Um, So just one final question, guys. Um, There's a whole bunch of, I guess, con and QCA students here listening in and preparing for their own lifetime of following Jesus either as an artist or a musician. Um, So what advice do you have for them right now as they're kind of at the con and QCA? How can they keep growing and living for Jesus in preparation for that time ahead, I guess, when they're leading? I guess as an artist, uh, it's very easy to... Um, become so sort of like obsessed with what you're, you're doing, whether you're, what you're practicing or making or whatever it is. Um, uh, yeah, I'd have periods where like that's just taking all of my focus and attention. Um, but the times when I, um, I think it's important to be bold in your faith. And so that means uh, actually taking some of those moments of evangelism where you might be a little bit embarrassed or shy or, or quiet or not wanting to, to say something or ask that particular question that's on your mind. I think it's really important to do that. Um, yeah, and so some of the fondest memories I have of being a Christian at the con was just reading the Bible one-on-one with some non-Christians. Um, and so, yeah, like really great, as I was saying before, to give them the opportunity to ask those questions. So I'd say take a moment to, to not be dwelling in your art as much. Not that it's not important or not valued, but uh, there's something greater and something bigger to what your life should be about, I think. And so to take that step of being bold, uh, to sharing your faith and asking those questions of other people to help them think about their faith, I think is really important. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Nathan. Kate, what have yeah, what are your kind of reflections? Yeah, that's all awesome, Nathan. I like fully agree. And I think we always like as artists, I think, and Christians, we're always like swinging between or for me it's like sometimes music is like seems really important and other times it's like you know, the balance is always changing. So yeah, just keeping a check on that, I guess. And um, yeah, asking God as much as you can to like help you um, keep him at the center. Um, And that makes music so much more fulfilling when you're freed from it being 
um, like your whole identity and everything that you live for and um, yeah, frees you up to love the people around you and all that kind of thing. Um, yeah, I'd also say just like for me, um, yeah, Christian community has been so important and as, as musicians we're often like moving around a lot, whether it's cities or countries maybe one day um yeah so I think like just investing in yeah a local church has been like such a powerful um thing for me and also in like the Christian community wherever you might find yourself like if that's at the con or um yeah it's just been so important to be built up and like intentionally seeking out um those relationships um to yeah let God um work through those people in your life yeah well, thanks so much, guys. That's yeah, I love hearing from you, just seeing you again and hearing from your wisdom about um, just your reflections on your time. Um, we're going to hand over to Peter now. Uh, he's popped into view. Um, so, yeah, well, thanks again. And yeah, hang around. We might have some other questions in the chat for you. Um, if you're on Zoom, whack some in for, the, for Nathan and Kate. But yeah, we'll hand over to Peter now. So, thanks, Peter. Thanks, guys. So great to hear from you. And yeah, looking forward to chatting a bit more with you guys uh, afterwards. I'm going to kick off tonight uh, with a story. Uh, it could be a story of someone you know, or maybe it's your own story. I don't know. Uh, see if this sounds familiar. It's a story of someone who is overweight, or at least they, they weigh more than they like to, and they want to do something about it. They've made a resolve. And so uh, they take some steps, they see a dietitian and they get a plan together, um, they start a diet, and, and this guy who's on this diet, he, he follows the diet really carefully, he eats healthy all day, he has the healthy breakfast, uh, he has the healthy lunch, he has the healthy dinner, he starts exercising regularly, and then two months later, he eagerly jumps on a scale, waiting to see what changes happened, at the dietitian's office and he finds that he hasn't lost any weight at all after two months of hard effort and so the dietitian sits down and he goes so you've been exercising uh, you've been eating this for breakfast this for lunch this for dinner you haven't had any snacks between so hang on what's going on here you've been doing all the right things let me just ask one more question do you eat anything after dinner and at this point, the guy who's on the diet says, well, yeah, I mean, I've exercised in the morning and I've made a real effort to eat all day. And so last thing I do at night just to reward myself is I have a big bowl of ice cream, a big bowl of ice cream. And, but, you know, I, I'm doing everything else right. And so the dietitian just kind of looks at him and says, well, you're actually undermining everything else, the, 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 the exercise, the, the brekkie, the lunch, the dinner. Uh, all of that's just wasted because you've still got this part of your life that you haven't addressed yet, right? You've still got this section that you're not yet doing the right thing. So if you change some of your life, it's not the same as changing all of it. it even if you change most of your life, it's not going to be enough. Uh, if you change a part of your life, but then keep this little bit and say, no, this bit is mine hands off this bit, I deserve this bit, I'm not changing this bit, then it won't work. Uh, if you don't change anything, everything, sorry, none of it will work. Uh, friends, tonight we're going to see that something similar can happen when you follow Jesus and you call Jesus King. Uh, if you've been following with us in, in Paul's letter to the Philippians, the amazing news that we hear in Philippians is that there is a new king who's begun to reign, and it's King Jesus. Uh, Jesus has come into the world. He's died on the cross. He's risen from the grave. He's been made king of all. And when you believe in him, God gives you righteousness and makes you a citizen of his kingdom. So you go from being a Roman citizen to a citizen of Jesus' kingdom. You go from being an Aussie citizen to a Jesus citizen. And, and the call of Jesus is when you're part of his kingdom, when you're one of his citizens, it, it it's for every part of our life to bring everything under his reign, under his rule. But so often we don't do that. We, we bring most of our life or some of our life under his reign. But just over here, 
we're still having a bowl of ice cream after dinner. We still keep part of it for me. All of us do it. And so tonight's going to be a challenge to all of us because we're going to be asking which parts of your life haven't been impacted by knowing Jesus? What part of your life needs to come under the reign of King Jesus? Now, if you're not a Christian and you're following along with us tonight, well, first of all, it's great that you're here, but you're going to be hearing what it might look like if you call Jesus King and to submit not just part of your life, but all of your life to him. Uh, in many ways, this is what all of Philippians has been about, how to bring all of your life under the reign of King Jesus rather than the reign of King Caesar. But in this chapter, the final ch chapter of Philippians, uh, things get extremely practical. Paul puts some flesh on the bones, as it were, of what doing this looks like in practice and in, in the, uh, the mundaneness of everyday life. Uh, this is all a part of what Paul described last week as reaching forward to what's ahead in chapter 3, verse 13, and, and what he starts by describing for us in verse 1 tonight as standing firm in the Lord. Uh, I hope you're enjoying those mixed metaphors from Paul. Uh, running forward in chapter 3 is standing firm in the start of chapter 4, but they're both illustrations of living with Jesus as king which is what all of us are called to do. A few reminders as we get into it tonight. Uh, I'm going to stop at a couple of different points, two or three points for a question and answer throughout the talk. So if you've got any questions or comments or thoughts, drop them in the Zoom chat or the Facebook uh, comments. That'd be great. Uh, some of us will be hanging around for just 15 or 20 minutes or so after the talk. And if you'd like to have your own uh, opportunity to question Kate and Nathan, Please hang around for that afterwards. Uh, if you don't get your question answered during the talk by me, uh, I'll talk about it then. Uh, make your one of these handy, please. Uh, keep your Bible handy. I've got three points tonight. Uh, the three points are number one, fighting. Number two, worrying. And number three, dwelling. These are all things that should be impacted by King Jesus, all parts of our life that need to be brought under his rule. So fighting, worrying, and dwelling. And in a way, they're all bowls of ice cream after dinner. They're behaviours that undermine our other efforts as we try to live for King Jesus. You might be eating one of those bowls or all three of those bowls of ice cream. You might be eating a different bowl that Paul doesn't talk about here, but the question is, which parts of your life haven't been impacted by knowing Jesus? So come with me to our first bowl of ice cream, our first point, fighting. Fighting. Because something tragic is happening uh, in the Philippian church. Two women who are known to the whole church and who are known to Paul, they're fighting each other. They're fighting. They used to serve side by side for King Jesus, but now... It's fisticuffs. They're fighting each other. Check it out with me uh, from verse 2 of tonight's passage. Chapter 4, verse 2, Philippians. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I also ask you, true partner, to help these women who have contended for the gospel at my side, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. So what do we see here? We see... Paul urges Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord instead of fighting each other. They need to agree with each other. They need to agree in the Lord. What does it mean to agree in the Lord? Well, it's a throwback to chapter 2 of Philippians. So flip uh, back to chapter 2 with me. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and looking at verse 2. There in verse 2 of chapter 2, Paul says, Make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Jump down to verse five. There in verse five, he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. Now, what does that look like? Well, uh, in chapter two, verses five to eight, we read that Jesus, even though he's God, he doesn't look out for himself but instead he becomes a servant, he becomes a slave, he 
He puts others before himself and he humbly submits to death, even death on the cross. And so the call is for these two women who are fighting each other, these two church members who are fighting each other, Euodia and Syntyche, Jesus humbled himself and gave up his life for you. So you guys need to stop fighting and do the same for each other. Instead of fighting each other and disagreeing with each other, you should imitate Jesus and agree, think the same way as Jesus. See, these women have lost sight of who they are. They've lost sight of who each other are as well. I'm sure the grammar, they've lost sight of who the other one is, right? Just like we can lose sight of who we are and who those are, who those around us are in Christ. And it's sad because flip with me back to chapter four now, uh, back in chapter four in verse three. This is sad because these women we read in verse three, they were contending with Paul side by side in the cause of the gospel. But now they've spiraled into a turf war. Now, I don't know if you've experienced this kind of thing before, turf wars in church. Uh, it's never a pleasant experience, but it's sadly pretty common. Uh, churches fight over all kinds of things. Uh, the first fight I can remember growing up in church was over the colour of the carpets. But people fight over things like baptism, how often to have the Lord's Supper, who should be the pastor, the hymn lovers versus the Hillsong lovers. There's so many different things that Christians can fight about in church, but it shouldn't be that way. We should be looking to Jesus and agreeing in the Lord. We should be known for our humble other person centeredness. Now, I want you to imagine for me in your mind, maybe this sounds like a movie you've seen or a book you've read, that there's on this side two armies, right? This side has two armies and this side has two. I love the visual possibilities of doing this on Zoom. So you got two armies over here, you got two armies over here, they're facing each other, they're ready to fight, and they start to come together on the field of battle. But then all of a sudden, one of the armies turns sideways and starts fighting the other army who's meant to be their ally, right? So what's happening? There's two armies approaching here, there's two armies approaching here, but then these two start fighting each other, even as the enemy keeps approaching. So what's going to happen, right? The armies that are fighting each other instead of being allies, they're screwed, right? They've got no hope because the enemy is approaching. They've got the advantage. And that one poor army who's been turned on and stabbed in the side, it's just going to be a tragic bloodbath. Now, Euodia and Syntyche, these two women in the church, they're like an army. They're advancing together against a common enemy, but all of a sudden, they stop in their tracks, they turn sideways, and they're fighting each other. They start fighting with each other, even as the opposing enemy still advances on them. Friends, it's a losing battle. And if you call Jesus king, the call is, don't do it. Don't do it. It shouldn't happen. And so let me ask you, uh, if you're a Christian, if you call Jesus king, who are you disagreeing with? Who have you turned sideways and started jabbing? Have you forgotten that following Jesus means living for his kingdom and contending together side by side in the common cause of the gospel? His cause, you see, not your cause. Uh, we disagree with each other because of selfish ambition and we need to agree in the Lord and have the same mind as Jesus. It's okay to agree on stuff that isn't important, like whether or not to have pineapple on pizza. How about dropping that one in the comments? Do you think pineapple should be on pizza? I don't really want to open that, right? And there are some things that we should disagree about because they are central core gospel issues. And I think I can see people asking questions about this in the Zoom, Zoom chat already. But when it comes to the core stuff, the core beliefs and how we should live for Jesus, we need the humble other person centeredness that comes from fixing our eyes on Jesus. And so who are you disagreeing with? And who in humility 
that you need to apologize to or, or, or soften towards. I'm going to pause right there, speaking of the group, the, the Zoom chat, uh, and uh, see what comments we've got here. It's Q&A time. Bacon and eggs, healthy brekkie. Chasey, I have eggs for brekkie every day. Occasionally, there's a bit of ham in it. Um, yes, Catherine has just reminded us we have cake in the fridge. It has pink icing. Uh, Sintiki, yeah, it's, a, it's not a name you hear very often, Josie. Sintiki, you could name your cat that. Maybe we should change our cat's name. I'm not sure how confident we can be in knowing what's right. Maybe it could be a good dog name. Or oh, are you talking about the pronunciation of Sintiki? I understand. How do we balance, thank you, Will Angridge, for a real comment. How do we balance fighting and disagreeing with each other with genuine concern and love for each other and sound doctrine? Every other comment is about pineapple and I should have guessed that that was coming. That's a great idea, uh, Will. I think one of the key words is fighting. Uh, fighting is it's rarely something we should ever do. We should only ever do it if we absolutely have to. And it's obviously something we would do not with our fisticuffs, uh, but with gentle, humble, prayerful, loving, gracious words. Uh, I mentioned just before, it's okay to um, disagree about core stuff. So the centrality of the Bible, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the necessity of the Holy Spirit, stuff that you might articulate in something like the Apostles' Creed, if you know the Apostles' Creed, more recently popularised by a Hillsong song, this I believe, uh, but go back to the Creed because it's better. Um, it's okay to disagree about that stuff, but if it's stuff like the carpet or the paint colour or if it's, if it's stuff that's, that, that it might be really important to you, but it's not gospel central, then it's stuff that needs to be talked about rather than thought about. And we all need to consider the possibility that getting our way is not necessarily the best way. And in fact, sometimes the best way is not to think about my way or to think about your way, but to think about, well, we want unbelievers to come here about Jesus. So how can we actually make our decision on the basis of proclaiming Jesus and bringing more people to know him and making that a priority? I hope that helps. I'm just going to check the Facebook chat. Yeah, can't see anything on the uh, uh, Facebook chat right now that looks like a question. So I'm going to move on to the second point. Uh, we've seen that when you call Jesus King, it means all of your life needs to be impacted. That includes our fighting, and it also includes our worrying. So come with me to my second point, our next bowl of ice cream, as it were. Point two, worrying. Uh, Paul deals with a bunch of different things we should and shouldn't be doing in this next paragraph. It's a bit scattergun. It's a bit speaking of battle scenes. But here's where he lands it. He says, don't get stuck in worrying. Check it out with me uh, from verse 4 of Ephesians. Sorry, Philippians 4. We're in Philippians. Philippians 4, verse 4. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love this bit. First thing to notice is that Paul mentions rejoicing twice in verse four. Uh, he's also mentioned rejoicing throughout all the letters of the Philippians, so much so that the Philippians call it the letter of joy. If you're learn about joy, you could do far worse than reading Philippians a bit. Uh, rejoicing is a big part of living for Jesus. So here's a few thoughts on joy. Christian joy, the joy of following Jesus and knowing Jesus, it's not the same as just happiness. It's not just happy, happy, joy, joy, I'm so happy. Because Paul says throughout the letter that he's in prison. He says that he's anxious. He cries real tears of sadness that he writes about in this letter as well. And so clearly the joy he's talking about isn't just a shallow passing emotion. It's a deeper, richer, lasting thing that, that, that goes 
deeper than the ups and downs of his everyday life. It's, it's like an anchor holding him fast or a weight that is, is helpful to him, that keeps him grounded. Uh, and it, it comes from fixing his eyes. It comes for us for fixing our eyes beyond what we can see right in front of you, right? And seeing Jesus, having that tunnel vision that we've talked about in previous weeks for Jesus and having tunnel vision for the eternal home that we're heading towards in Jesus. So joy comes from seeing where you're headed, seeing how Jesus is helping you get closer to that eternally joyful home, even now, even during COVID, even during loneliness, even during stress and anxiety and depression and loss and sadness and exams and everything that's going on for us. Even in the midst of suffering, we can rejoice, in other words, knowing that we're loved, knowing he hears our cries, that he'll carry us through and the hard times won't last forever. They'll be over soon. That's what it means to rejoice, seeing clearly the reality that's ours in Jesus because of his death on the cross for us. And the Philippians and we should be rejoicing. And next, the part of the way that that rejoicing expresses itself is in verse 5. Our graciousness is part of living for Jesus, relating to each other with gentleness, with grace and understanding is a part of living for Jesus. This is what uh, Euodia and Syntyche need towards each other. And it's what you and I need as we relate towards each other. Uh, this is one of my biggest struggles, speaking personally for a second. Uh, at the moment, I'm just, I just really struggle and find it hard to be gracious with my kids all the time. And it's something that I need to consciously work at every single day because that's what it looks like for me to, to deal with that bowl of ice cream in my life that, that is making it hard for everything else, right? Uh, that's for me. What about you? So rejoice, be gracious to each other. But where Paul lands all of this is worrying or rather not worrying. You heard it in verse six. Don't worry about anything that's full on isn't it don't worry about anything uh, because we live in the age of anxiety i don't know if you guys like jamie cullum catherine and i like listening to jamie cullum we've been listening to him a bit lately and he's got a song on his most recent album called the age of anxiety because that's the age we live in isn't it it's, it's a defining feature of our time that was true before covid but now of course it's only gotten worse so pause for a second. What do you think the opposite of worry is? What do you think it is to do the opposite of being anxious? Drop some ideas in the chat if you've got some thoughts. What is the opposite of worry? Well, if you look at what this passage says tonight, according to Paul, the opposite of worry or the alternative to anxiety is prayer it's prayer have a look at verse six again verse six don't worry about anything but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god according to paul our worrying needs to come under the rule of king jesus and the way that that happens is prayer bringing our worries to God, telling him our worries and asking him for help. And not just some of our worries, but all of them. Verse six actually says, everything you're worried about, that's what you should be presenting to God in prayer. In other words, nothing's too big, nothing's too small. If you're worried about it, that's the rule. If you're worried about it, pray about it. And if you do that, well, you saw in verse 7 what's on offer to you if you pray about your worries. Verse 7, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In other words, when you pray your worries to God, God's peace guards your heart and God's peace guards your mind in Jesus. So I got you to picture an army before, now picture a different one, right? Picture an army, army in a circle, but encamped around here. 
around your heart. A squadron of soldiers looking after you. Now, that would have been a pretty potent image for those living in the kingdom of Rome. It's, it's military language, and that's the language that Paul uses here. They saw soldiers around them all day, every day. They were used to the Romans being around, right? But Paul's saying here, when you pray your worries to God, it's like you get your own military guard around your heart and around your mind. And it's so unusual. It's, it's, it's an experience that can't quite be explained with ordinary words. Right? It, it surpasses all understanding, Paul says in verse 7. It surpasses understanding. In other words, it, it, it's, a, it's an out-of-this-world peace, a calm that doesn't make sense unless you're experiencing it. This, if, if you're with us tonight and you're not a Christian, this is what you're missing out on, right? We, we can't fully describe to you what it's like to have this peace with God. You have to taste it. You have to try it and so you should do it, right? If you don't pray, you don't know. Right? It, it, this calm doesn't make sense until you experience it. And so I've got two questions for you as we think about worry. Number one, what are you worried about and have you prayed about it? Number one, uh, what are you worried about? And number two, have you prayed about it? Are you praying about it and bringing it to God? If not, then that's a part of your life that's yet to come under Jesus' reign and you should pray your worries. If you don't pray your worries, you, you miss out of that out-of-this-world peace the the support that surpasses understanding right far too often i'm guilty of this right i i stress about something i think about it i dwell about it i, I worry about it i lose sleep over it i fret about it and for some stupid reason i don't pray about it i'm not always good at remembering to pray now, I don't mind saying I've had issues with anxiety over the years, especially since having kids. And a few years ago, I realised that there were a lot of things that I was worried about that I didn't pray about and that needed to change. So I make more of an effort to do it these days, but it's, it's still not automatic. It's still not as automatic as it should be. I have a long way to go and I'm still working on it. I was talking with Catherine about this during the week as well. I still worry about some things without praying about them. And sometimes even Catherine and I can talk to each other about stuff that we're worried about with our family. And then we don't pray about it. And I'm saying, hey, you know, oh, I think we need to get better at this. And, and she agrees, right? Even if it's just quick for 10 seconds, right? It still counts. But what about you? What are you worried about? And are you praying about it? Pause now for a Q and A. I can see the the chat's been bumping along. Hopefully, it's not all about pineapple. Did you just say it's okay to disagree about the core tenets of the creed? No, I said that's a good example of the stuff we shouldn't disagree about. Thanks for clarifying, Will. Sorry, I'm obviously stumbling over words tonight, and I'm sorry if you heard that. Uh, yes, I'm saying the Apostles' Creed is a good example of the core stuff we should agree about. What about a fight where each party wants to make the humble sacrifice, kind of like both sides saying, I want you to enjoy the carpet, so we'll choose your carpet colour. That's a great idea, Daniel. That sounds like a great church to be a part of. And those people should together go, well, hang on, let's stop thinking of each other and think about the non-Christian and what would be good for them. Yeah, let the argument about paint colours slide. It's not worth disagreeing over. That's good. Josie, you came so close with the gratitude one. So what's the opposite of prayer? Josie said gratitude. And technically, I think she's right because it is part of that sentence. Uh, prayer, petition and thanksgiving, bring your requests to God. That's great. So Will asks... Where and how do we draw the line between arguments which we should let slide, like paint colours, and disagreements on things like the sacraments or church music or other aspects of church practice which are seen as less important than the core tenets of the faith? And Josie builds on that by saying, at what point 
should we draw the line between going to a church where we don't agree with some of the less important things that go on and finding a different church that might not deal with those issues to the same extent as the old one? Well, this is a very case by case thing. Uh, I'd say firstly that leaving a church is not something you would want to do quickly. It's not something you'd want to do without praying and thinking and reflecting and meditating and talking, hopefully with all the wider Christians and you, or at least peers uh, who can help you think it through. Because uh, often our reasons for wanting to leave a church are not necessarily all good and godly and helpful. So don't make that kind of decision quickly. It's the kind of thing you might uh, decide over, over months, uh, maybe even years. Uh, secondly, each church will have a different uh, set of core beliefs. So even our AFES group has a set of core beliefs and uh, doctrines that you have to agree to in order to be a leader and in order to be a staff member for the Australian Fellowship of Evangelical Students, AFES. Uh, church denominations like uh, the Anglican Church will have the 39 articles. The Westminster Confession of Faith is the, um, the big set of outlines you get with the Prezi denominations. On just about every denomination or even non-denominational church will have a set of things that they think are valuable. You can usually find them on church websites, the what we believe bit of their website. You can usually find them there. And you need to actually be able to hold those yourself up to scripture, scripture and say, are these right? Are these trustworthy? Okay. Uh, and... If you genuinely think that a church is on about stuff other than what the Bible and scripture prioritizes and if their core beliefs or maybe their core beliefs are great, but when you go for weeks and weeks and months and months, it's not the same stuff as what they talk about from up the front or in, in Bible study groups or whatever, that's when you might want to start to think, okay, I wonder if I'm in the right place. And I have to say it is pretty common for uh, students to show up at university to already be a part of a church family or maybe a new, join a new church family because they've just moved. Uh, and they come under Bible teaching at the AFES group, like our group, the group of Christian students uh, group that meets at the Con and the College of Art. And over weeks, over months, maybe even over years, you start to realise, I'm all of a sudden realising, or not all of a sudden, I'm realising over time that the things that my church that I've been a part of for a long time might not necessarily be what I think are the most important things for a church to be teaching a, a biblical or gospel set of those kind of things and it's not all that uncommon for someone at that point in life to start thinking about moving churches if you want a great book I wish I could kind of find it quickly on the shelf without no I'm not sure it is if you want a great book for helping you think that through I don't think I'll be able to spot it quickly there's a great book by Philip Jensen um, and Tony Payne called Guidance and the Voice of God that helps you to think through uh, listening clearly to God's priorities in scripture and making decisions like what church should I go to? Who should I marry? What job should I just do uh, uh, after I finish uni? Daniel James says, I just finished that book this week. So you can ask him if it's worth reading. And I encourage you to do that. That's a, that's a great book for helping you think through should I leave church question. That was a long answer. I hope it was helpful. Join uh, with uh, us afterwards on Zoom if you'd like to ask more questions about that. But I'm going to move on now because I don't want to keep us too long. Great questions, by the way. My last point's the quickest one. So lucky you, all right? When you accept Jesus as king, you need to let him impact every bit of your life. We've seen that includes our fighting. We've seen that includes our worrying. And finally, our last point, our last bowl of ice cream. You might be hungry for ice cream now. That's fine. But the third thing we're going to be thinking about is our dwelling, our dwelling. Because when you live with Jesus as king, he should become king of your thoughts, king of your mind, and the way that you think should be transformed. So we're no longer with our minds to dwell on worldly stuff. We're to dwell on good stuff, godly stuff instead. Uh, read it with me from verse 8 of Philippians 4. Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, 
if there is any moral excellence and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is in some ways extremely broad, right? So whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable or morally excellent or praiseworthy, well, dwell on these things. It's a hard verse to apply, yeah? It's hard to work out what it's on about, but I find it helpful to think about this verse in reverse. So think about it backwards. Think about what if it was this? Don't dwell on things that aren't honourable. Don't dwell on things that aren't just, aren't pure. Then the rubber starts to hit the road, right? Because we all have stuff in our life, uh, stuff we watch, stuff we listen to, stuff we follow online, stuff we read, stuff we do. Maybe when you're on your own, maybe at the end of the day, maybe after dinner when the door's closed, maybe in the hope that others don't see. And deep down, we cannot describe it as good. And it's that stuff, the stuff you try and keep in the dark, especially from your Christian friends, that this verse is talking about. For example, if you're sinking all of your time all of your spare time into violent games or, or even just any games that take up all of your spare time, well, maybe you're not making the most of applying this verse. It doesn't mean you shouldn't play games. Not at all. It's a question of balance. But maybe you need to dwell on God more. Maybe you need to dwell on peace from God rather than what annoys you about your Euodia or your Syntyche who you're fighting with? There's a common thing I hear from uni students uh, all the time. You find it hard to read the Bible every day, right? I hear that from just about every uni student I know. But when well, you spend plenty of time on YouTube or social media or other websites or hobbies, right? And once again, it's not that those things are bad. It's just a question of, well, what are you dwelling on? And have you brought all of your life under the reign of King Jesus? Right? Are you still tucking into that secret bowl of ice cream at night that's ruining your diet? What is it for you? Uh, maybe it's time for you to kick that porn habit, to delete some apps off your phone, even if they're not particularly wrong they're just distracting you from dwelling on good things maybe you need to move your devices off the dining table and just put a bible there instead that's what i've tried this year and it's been brilliant for me a huge change do what you've heard from me says paul in verse 9 and the god of peace will be with you when you bring all of life under the reign of King Jesus, it's good for you. It transforms every part of your life and you experience peace. It sounds good, doesn't it? Uh, I didn't even tee Nathan up for this, but I was grateful when Nathan said earlier, it's easy to spend all of your time dwelling on your art, dwelling on your playing and on your practicing, but we shouldn't just be dwelling on our art and getting caught up on it, right? We shouldn't be. We should be dwelling on good things the things of jesus now time is short i'm going to save the final q a for those who hang around uh, on zoom afterwards so if you've got any questions hold them till then i've got a few brief things to say in application uh, if you're still with us tonight and you're not a christian do you realize that your life isn't your life god actually made you to know him and live for him and so what makes you think you can live your life for yourself and get away with it. Besides which, life's better with Jesus. It really is, both now and forever. That doesn't mean it'll be easy, but knowing Jesus we see is surpassingly valuable compared to knowing everything and anything else in this world.
And so I want to urge you, give Jesus a try and do it before it's too late and you have to bow the knee unwillingly. If, like most people probably watching tonight, you are a Christian, there's a quote from a guy named Adrian Kuyper. Let me read it to you. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Mine. If you didn't follow that, Jesus looks at all of us and he says, mine. It's mine. And so what are your bowls of ice cream? And will you bring them out of the dark and under the reign of King Jesus? I know it's hard. Well, believe me, I know. I experience this every day myself. But it's a battle worth fighting and one that you fight with peace. Let me finish with one more army picture, right? This is not from one movie in particular. This is from a thousand different movies or a thousand different books. So you pick the one you know, right? For me, it's Lord of the Rings. That's what I'm thinking of at the moment. So there's an enormous battle scene, right? Two opposing armies and the good guys have almost been defeated. The bad guys are winning. The sad music is playing. There's high drama and it looks like the battle is over. They're fighting hard. It's tiring. They're reaching forward. They're standing firm. They're doing the best that they can. And then what they see in the end of verse five is the Lord is near. The Lord is near. All of a sudden, a rescue appears on the horizon. The thing that they've been waiting for that's going to tip them over to win the victor appears and it's all over. Friends, the battle will never be over before Jesus returns. But the Lord is near. He's coming soon. He's on the horizon. And we need to stand firm and strain forward together, bringing all of our life under his reign, rejoicing in the work of his cross, eagerly awaiting his return to live is christ to die is gain the lord is near let's pray our good god and our heavenly father please forgive us for not praying and just getting stuck in our worry for not rejoicing and for dwelling on things that just aren't helpful. Father, thank you for Jesus who shows us how to rejoice, how to pray, how to dwell, how to live, how to honour you, how to stand firm and to strain forward towards what's ahead. Help us to trust him and allow his rule to penetrate every part of our heart and our mind and our life. Help us to turn from those secret bits that we want to keep from ourselves, that we want to have as mine and help us to realise that it's all his and so live for his honour instead of our own and give us that peace that comes from knowing you and praying to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Peter. So, friends, what a great talk. How amazing is it that we have a God who will guard our hearts and look after us? So let's not waste the gift that we're given by God by telling him that part of it is ours. Let's stand firm in the Lord. I know this week after this talk, I'm going to be considering what parts of my life should change that need to change to honor God more and just continue to love him and how I can love other people in my churches. So thanks for that. Thanks for coming. And same time next week, if you would like to come back. Thank you.